Let's open up our Bibles to the uh, book of the Revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we make our way verse by verse through the New Testament, we arrive now at verse 8 of chapter 2. Now remember that we are in this section of the, of the book that is known as the seven letters to the seven churches. The entire book of the Revelation was written to these seven churches, but we're in this section where each of these churches are receiving an individual message that's being dictated to John from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we call them the seven letters, but we notice that these are very short. I suppose we could say the seven text messages to the seven churches, because even the letter that we're gonna read here this morning, you're only talking about four verses. So though these letters are very short, though, I believe that they provide us with just incredible insight because they are dealing with, I, I think, the greatest enemy that we face, and that is spiritual self-deception. Your greatest enemy is for you to be thinking more highly of yourself than you ought. And all of us, as the followers of Christ, there is that tendency for us to believe that we're more spiritually mature than, the, than we are, we're closer to the Lord than we are, we're more committed to the Lord than what we are. And so from the lips of Jesus to our ears, what we are reading is a clear understanding of what is important to Jesus Christ and what is not important to Jesus Christ. What does the Lord Jesus Christ want to see in his church, and what is it that he never wants to see in his church? So this is, as I say, this is probably one of the most important sections of the entire scripture, these seven short messages to these seven churches. Now, the last time uh, we were together, we were dealing with the church at Ephesus. Now, again, Ephesus was deceived about their true condition. This was a hardworking church. This was an exciting church. This was a church that was reaching all of Asia Minor. But all of that was being overshadowed by the one fault that Christ pointed out, and that is they had forgotten that all of this is about your relationship, our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So often we get all worked up as far as church activity. It's all about administering the church. It's all about raising funds. It's all about growing the local church. And it's just work, 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 and organize, organize, organize. And that is not the primary focus of the church. The primary focus is every day just falling more in love love with the Lord Jesus Christ and what does the Lord want to do how can we grow our relationship with him so it's easy for us to be deceived you remember now you had the Pharisees these guys about 6,000 of them at the time of Christ they were considered the best of the best they were considered you know the spiritual special forces of Israel I mean they were always in church they were always reading the Torah if you were to ask them do you know God are you close to God they would be offended at the very asking of the question and yet Jesus said to them in Matthew chapter 23 he said you snakes, you offspring of vipers, how shall you escape the judgment of hell? These, these are guys that believe that there was nobody on the planet who was closer than them, and they were spiritually deceived concerning their true condition. And so one of the exciting things as we go through these seven letters is that we can use it for our own testing. Which of these churches sounds like our church? Which of these churches would I be most comfortable in? Which of these churches reflects best who I am as a spiritual person? Now, all of these churches, this is a satellite image of Western Turkey along the Aegean. And see, we started out with the first church, Ephesus, kind of right there in the middle. Now, where we go from here, we're moving up the coast about 35, maybe 40 miles to the city of Smyrna. Now, Ephesus, as you remember from last time we were together, Ephesus was the second 
largest city in the Roman Empire, now coming to Smyrna. Smyrna was about half the size. But Smyrna, by all indications, was without a doubt the most beautiful city in Asia Minor. It was called the Flower of Asia. It was filled with magnificent architecture. They had the main street going through the center of the city. It was known as the Golden Street. It was lined with every pagan temple imaginable. It was just a gorgeous setting. Now, it was a very pagan city. All of the gods, both in the Greek pantheon as well as the Roman pantheon, all of the gods were present there, but that was not what was presenting the greatest problem for the church. There was a very, there was a, a very um, unusual type of paganism that was causing all of the trouble in the church in Samaria, and it was a weird patriotism that was being expressed for the city of Rome. It, it's interesting that Smyrna, of all of the ancient cities, Smyrna was the very first city to align itself with the city of Rome. That somewhere along the line, the city fathers of Smyrna had a good understanding that Rome was going somewhere. Even before Rome was the Roman Empire, Smyrna said, these guys are going somewhere, and we're hitching our wagon to them. And in fact, Cicero said, Smyrna is one of our most faithful and most ancient allies. In fact, in the city of Smyrna, you would have found the very first temple built in honor of the spirit of Rome, which was a female deity by the name of Roma. And they believed that everything that the Roman Empire ushered into the world was the direct byproduct of the spirit of Rome. And not only that, 60 years before Jesus dictates this letter to John, we find that Smyrna had received over 11 other cities the privilege of building the very first temple designed for the worship of Caesar. So they've got the first temple. It, there wasn't even one built in the city of Rome yet. They built the first temple to the spirit of Rome, and they built the very first temple for the worship of Caesar. Now, what they had going on was what was known as Pax Deorum. And what Pax Deorum was is peace with the gods. What they believed was all of the gods were to be worshipped. Chief among them was the spirit of Rome. And as all of the gods would be worshipped, then the gods would take care of society. So that meant if one of the gods were offended, one of the ways that you would know is that there would be some kind of natural disaster. There would be an earthquake. There would be a volcano. There would be famine. There would be pestilence, you know, a, a pandemic. You would know that one of the gods was upset. Now, this created a horrific problem for the church at Smyrna because it would be required that they worship the spirit of Rome and that they would worship Caesar. And if they didn't, well then obviously the spirit of Rome is going to be upset. Now Tertullian, several years after this, one of the early church fathers, he said concerning the condition that the church had, he said, if the Tiber River reaches the walls, if the Nile does not rise to the fields, if the sky does not move or the earth does, if there is famine, if there is plague, the cry is at once, Christians to the lions. You see, he's, he's allowing us to see the church was in a no-win situation. Whenever anything bad happened, it happened because the gods were upset, and the gods were upset at these Christians, and the gods are going to continue to be upset with us until we get rid of these Christians. And so often it was the church's refusal to worship and honor the spirit of Rome. You see, you and I, we think of the Romans. I don't know how you feel about them, but I think they were jerks, right? I mean, they bludgeoned the Mediterranean world into submission. And we see what they did to Israel. We see what they did to the early church. 
and we make the mistake of believing that most of the people in the Roman Empire didn't like the Roman Empire. That is not the case. Most of the people were in love with the Roman Empire. For most of the people, this was the best of times, right? They had an incredible road system. There, there was peace for once you had these city-states that were constantly warring over resources. You now have safety on the high seas. You've got goods and services flowing into the marketplace at a cheaper price than what, what they have ever experienced before. In many of these metropolitan cities, they had sanitation, they had flushing toilets, they had the aqueduct. I mean, this was the best of times, and they believed that it was the spirit of Rome that was allowing them to experience this wonderful wonderful life that they were living. Now, all of a sudden, how would you feel about a group of unpatriotic people in your community that is running the risk of ticking off the spirit that is blessing your life? You're going to be very adversarial towards them. Now, William Barclay points out that the only thing Christians had to do was to burn a pinch of incense and to say, Caesar is Lord. They'd then receive a certificate and they would go their way and worship as they pleased. But that is precisely what the Christians would not do. They would give no man the name Lord. That name they would keep for Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. And this is what the Romans didn't get. What is your problem? Just burn the incense, say that Caesar is Lord, and you can go back to your little church and worship your little Jesus. We don't care, but we don't want you ruining everything for the rest of us. Let's keep the spirit of Rome happy, and let's make sure that we are honoring the spirit of Rome. So now we find this church, this little church of Smyrna, and they are living in the epicenter of patriotism. They are living in the epicenter of the worship of Caesar, and they are a small minority that is refusing to do what everybody else is doing, and they are suffering in unimaginable ways. Now, let's read what Jesus says, and I want you to take special note of what he doesn't say. Not only is it important that we understand what he does say, it's also important that we take note. What does he not say to this suffering church? Well, beginning in verse 8, we read this. Now, to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these things, says the first and the last, who was dead, or who literally became dead, and then came uh, to life. Now, once again, we notice this is addressed to the angel. We talked about this last time we were together, that most of the time in your Bible, when the word angel is being used, it's talking about a spiritual being. However, there are times in the Scripture where the context is telling us that the word angel or the word messenger, it can be translated either way, is referring to a human being. I took you to Matthew chapter 11 last time, where you remember that Jesus said that John the Baptist was an angel. He was a messenger that was sent from God. Well, John the Baptist had also sent some of his disciples to Jesus when John had been thrown into prison. He had some questions for Jesus. And Luke tells us in Luke chapter 7, he says, and when the messengers, that's our word here, angel, when the messengers of John were departed. You see, sometimes this word is talking about a human being, and I believe that that is indeed true with each of these seven churches, that we are talking about the head elder that God has established in these early Christian churches, and they are being called to account. Look, these churches have got some problems. Get off the dime. Begin to deal with it. I have placed you there. You've got responsibility to make sure that your congregations are heading in a spiritually healthy direction. Now, of course, the elder at this point would have been a man by the name of Polycarp. Polycarp at this point was in his early 30s. And you remember from our introduction to the book of the Revelation, I told you that in the last 10 years of John the Apostle's life, that John had poured himself into the lives of a handful of younger guys. He is now the last living apostle. 
He realizes there is a transition that is taking place. The old leadership is passing on. We now are requiring new leadership to take our place. Polycarp was one of these guys who was responsible uh, and one of these young guys that that John was pouring uh, into their life. There's about a handful of these guys, Ignatius, Polycarp, and, and others, and they, like John, became the pit bulls of the truth, and they were the guardians of the simple gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this guy is in now his early 30s. He is watching the church that he is responsible, getting the snot kicked out of it. Imagine. You're in your early 30s. You've got this responsibility before God. And you're watching your congregation suffer in just very incredible ways. Now, you remember that I told you that what Jesus says to each of these churches is that he goes back to chapter 1 and he takes a snippet from the overall description that John gives us of the Alpha and the Omega. Back in chapter one, we've got a long description. John turns and he sees who's speaking to him and he gives us this lengthy description. This is what he looked like. This is what he was wearing. This is what he was saying. This is what, what he spoke to me. And what Jesus does is that he goes back and he takes a little snippet from that description and he uses it in his address to these churches pointing out that there is something about him, there is something about who he is, there is something about what he has done that this church needs to be reminded of or this church has forgotten. Now, in the case of Ephesus, you remember that he identified himself as the one who's walking in the midst of the church. He's the one who has these angels in his right hand. He he is reminding them about relationship. He is reminding them about his nearness. He is reminding him, reminding them that he is not this distant God, that he wants to be in a close relationship with his people. That's what the church at Ephesus had forgotten. Now he says to this church that is suffering, I am the one who became dead, and I am alive again. He is speaking to a church who is understanding death, they're watching their members. Now, you know, we've got a prayer chain here, right? And, and if you're signed up to get the, on the prayer chain, you know, you, you'll have prayer requests come, come by every once in a while. You know, pray for so-and-so, they're having surgery. Uh, pray for so-and-so, you know, they, uh, they've lost their job. And, and th- those are the kind of prayer requests we have. On, on, in the Church of Smyrna, what you would have if you had this prayer chain is pray for so-and-so, they were just burned at the stake. All right? Pray for so-and-so, they were just crucified. Pray for so-and-so, they were fed to the lions. I mean, this is very hardcore, what this church is going through. And Jesus says to this church that is familiar with death, I died too, all right? I am not asking you to do anything that I was not willing to do myself. And however severe your week has been, however tough your life is, understand that it pales in comparison to the garbage that the Lord Jesus Christ allowed himself to be put through. You see, what happens to the American Christian? Because you and I, we are so accustomed to getting things uh, that we want, so accustomed to having things go our way, that what happens and the big threat for the American Christian is that of bitterness. And there are so many followers of Christ who have been defiled by bitterness where they're angry at God, they're mad at God. God is not running the show the way that they would like God to run the show. And so if this is how God is going to treat me, if this is how God is going to treat his father, well, no, thank you, I'm out of here. And it almost seems like bitterness is reaching an epidemic level in the American church. How many people do you know who were once terrific followers of the Lord Jesus Christ? And how many people do you know today? They have turned their back on faith and they have walked away. They've become disappointed in the church and they have become disappointed in the Lord of the church. And so he says to this church, look, let me remind you of something. 
I became dead, all right? And so I am not asking you to do anything that I was not willing to do myself. So he identifies marvelously with whatever pain, whatever trouble you have in your life. He understands betrayal. He understands being lied about. He understands being knifed, all right? He understands what it is like to be left all alone in one of the biggest trials that you are facing. He knows everything that we are going through. In fact, notice what he says here in verse 9. He says, I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. And notice that he says, now I know. Now that word know there, it means to know completely, to have complete knowledge. This is the very same word that John used in his gospel in John chapter 19 when Jesus was on the cross and we read that that after this, Jesus knowing all things were fulfilled. See, he knew everything. All right, everything has been fulfilled. Everything has been accomplished. And so it's all right now uh, for me to dismiss my spirit and to leave this situation. The Lord knows everything about your life. But isn't it amazing how much of our prayer time is spent trying to bring Jesus up to speed, right? Trying to bring Jesus into the loop here. Now, uh, Jesus, they said this, and I probably did didn't respond the best, and I said this, and wow, did they really get angry then, and they came back at me, and you're just sort of laying the whole conversation out for him, like he's not even aware of what happened, like he's looking over at Gabriel, why don't you keep me up to speed on this, why in the world am I just finding out about this now, no, our God knows absolutely everything from the beginning, all of the works of the Lord have been known by him, he knows everything that is going on on in your life. In prayer, all you have to do is cast your care upon him. You don't have to drone on and on and on about the circumstances of the conversation. Just get to your point, all right, and just lay the problem there at his feet and allow him to deal with it in his own wise way. Now, notice what he, we are told here that he knows. He knows their works, and these, no doubt, were very meager I mean, they, they, what was it like for this church to look 35 miles to the south at the church at Ephesus where they are rocking the Roman Empire for the glory of Christ? What was it like for this meager little church, this church that's barely hanging on, to look down at the church at Ephesus and see that they are totally Christianizing all of Asia Minor? The Apostle Paul no longer has to send missionaries to Asia Minor because all of them have heard about the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's very easy for us to get a very small view of ourselves and to think about, well, you know, who am I? And if I were somehow just to disappear, I mean, would anybody even know that I was gone? And it's very easy for us to have this idea that our life doesn't count, that there's really not much much here that the Lord can use, and we can, we can look at that highly gifted individual or that, that highly gifted church that's just, I, I remember years ago, this was, I, I, I don't know, probably 15, 20 years ago, I suppose, um, I, was, I was marrying, there was a young girl in our congregation who was marrying a guy uh, from Granger Church. Uh, you know, the mega church up there in South Bend. And, and so I was going to marry them up there in this huge church. And, of course, our congregate, we were just tiny. We were, we were just small, right? And so here's this hick pastor, you know, coming, you know, to the big city to do this wedding. I remember I walk into this building, and my daughter, my middle daughter, is, is there alongside me. And she says, Wow. Jesus loves them more than he loves us, right? And it's so easy for us to think of ourselves in that way. You know, we're just small potatoes. I mean, who are we? And yet the Lord says to this church that's just hanging on by a thread, look, I know what you're doing for me. I know your works. And remember that the Lord remembers even a cold glass of water. 
You just bless somebody with something as simple as a cold glass of water, you're going to be richly rewarded in the kingdom. He knows our works. Notice that he also says there that he knows our tribulation. Tribulation comes with the Greek word thalipsis, which means pressure. Imagine the pressure on parents in Smyrna trying to come up with enough resources to feed your family. See, you have to understand, all commerce was governed by trade guilds. And if you were not a member of a trade guild, you were not going to work, you're not going to sell anything, you're not going to be employed. You have got believers losing their jobs because they cannot be members of good standing in the trade guilds. Imagine what it was like for a father with young kids at home. You're trying to feed them, and so you're being interviewed you know, for the trade guild, and uh, the HR department is saying to you, uh, well, uh, it, it seems like all we need is your certificate. Uh, that you have worshipped the spirit of Rome. I think we're good to go. I think you can probably start Monday. And for that young father to say, um, I don't have one of those certificates. And for the HR department to say, well, why don't you go get one and when you get it, uh, come back and see us. Imagine the pressure that you're going to be under to feed your family. So the Lord says, I know all of that. And notice what he says there. That I also know, and the pressure, the tribulation, was causing Poverty. Now, this word poverty, I mean, this means utterly destitute. Thayer's Greek lexicon puts it this way. One who slinks and crouches, often involving the idea of roving about in wretchedness, reduce to begging. This is a congregation of people. They do not have two pennies to rub together. But notice what Jesus says here. Jesus says, you are rich. This is letting us know his view of wealth and our view of wealth is very, very different. How many American churches are going to stand in the judgment and hear the Lord say, you are impoverished? How many third world countries, how many third world countries that have churches in them, how many of those churches who are physically poor, how many of them are going to hear the Lord say, oh man, you are are rich. Now notice what Christ says now. Here is an impoverished church. Here is a church under incredible pressure. Notice what, what he says to them in or, or verse 10, or rather in verse 9, he speaks about the blasphemy that was coming from the Jewish community. You see, Rome had a very strange relationship with the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel had been grandfathered in. Rome looked at these Jews and said, you know, these are just weirdo people, and there's not many of them. And so rather than just hassle with them, getting them to worship Caesar, we just kind of let them alone. They're in a backwater place of the empire anyway. Who cares about them? Now, Christianity came out of Judaism, right? Our Lord is a Jew, is he not, right? So the, the early church, they were all Jewish. It was a Jewish movement. And in the early years, Rome overlooked Christianity and their unwillingness to worship Caesar because they just thought that they were Jews. Now, over time, the Jewish community made it very clear to the government officials, hey, these people, they are not us. We are not them. They are not us. They have no part in us at all. And this is why, as you go through the book of Acts, notice how many times when the Apostle Paul is getting grief, that grief is starting where? It's starting from the Jewish community. The Jews hated Christianity, and the Jews hated the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, in the Jewish Talmud, uh, they said this. They said, Jesus the Nazarene, who practiced sorcery and led astray and deceived Israel. All right, so they have got these Jewish communities stirring everything up and lying about them. They've got all of this pressure. They've got all of this poverty, right? What does Jesus say to them by way of encouragement? Notice verse 10. How encouraging would this be for you to hear? He says, do not fear any of those things which you are about excuse me, of the things that I'm about to suffer? I mean, as if yesterday wasn't bad enough. Now I learned that tomorrow is going to be, are you kidding me? About to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about 
right, to throw uh, some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Now, notice what he doesn't say. Notice that he doesn't say, hang on, Calvary is just about there. Notice that he doesn't say, well, you turn that frown upside down. The sun's going to come up tomorrow. You just need to think and grow rich, and all of these wonderful things are going to happen in your life. No, he, he, he says here, things are going to get worse, and you are going to be thrown into prison. Now, David Un, he makes this observation. Under the Roman legal system, imprisonment was usually not a punishment in itself. Rather, it was used either as a means of coercion to compel obedience to an order issued by a magistrate or as a place to temporarily restrain a prisoner before execution. Here it appears that imprisonment is viewed as a period of testing is primarily for the purpose of coercion, right? That, that the devil, the, the enemy of the faith, is going to be throwing some of you into prison, and you're going to stay there until you decide that you're going to straighten up, fly right, and worship the spirit of Rome. It's only going to get worse. And of course, I love what Vance Havner said. The saints of Smyrna, they had not been given a pep talk on how to win friends and influence people. They had no testimony of how faith made me the mayor of, Samir, of Smyrna. And they were not promised deliverance from tribulation and poverty. In fact, the worst was yet to come. And notice what the Lord said. The Lord, notice, the Lord is not offering them any earthly hope whatsoever. Notice, as you look at this suffering church, how different is the message that Smyrna was receiving from Christ than the message that many churches in the United States are receiving. You know, if you have enough faith, right, if you get rid of sin and unbelief in your life, you're going to be healed of everything, and you're going to have large bank accounts, and nothing is going to go wrong in your life. I think that the prosperity gospel is one of the most evil things that has ever been placed upon the church of Jesus Christ. Somebody that is struggling with some terminal disease, and then some self righteousness righteous Christian comes along and says, well, if you had enough faith, you know, God would heal you. If you had enough faith, you'd have enough money. If you had enough faith, you wouldn't have this problem going on in your life. Well, pray tell, why doesn't Jesus say that to this church? Christ is not saying, hey, you guys got enough faith. I'm going to pull you out of this. The reason why you're in trouble is you don't have enough faith. No, the reason why they're in trouble is because they are faithful, not because there's the absence of faith here. But the Lord gives them a promise. And the promise is, I'm going to give you the crown of life. You remain faithful to me until the day that you die. That's all any of us need to worry about. We don't need to worry about why has this happened. We don't need to worry about, well, how long is this going to go on and so forth. Now, notice that he does tell them that you're going to have this trouble now. You're going to have this tribulation, notice, for 10 days. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you want to know what that means, you're going to have to find a better church than this because I have no clue, all right? Now, I know that there are commentators that will say, well, you know, there were 10 emperors that persecuted the church. There were 10 great waves of persecution. I don't know about all of that. Now, as I read this, what I think to myself, the Lord is saying, is that, well, it's not going to go on forever, right? 10 days. It's, it's, it's going to be here, and there is a starting point and there's going to be an ending point to all of this. All I want you to focus on is that you be faithful until you stop breathing breath. That's all we've got to worry about. Let's not worry about the details as to why and to how long and all of these things. Let's just pray that God would so strengthen us that we would faithfully represent him in every season of life. Now we close with verse 11 where he tells us this. He that has an ear, all right? So uh, once again, this is moving it from the first century, bringing it into the 21st century. So this is a message, not just for Smyrna, 
This is a message for each and every one of us. I'm, I'm assuming you all have ears, all right? So if you've got an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying, what the Spirit says to the churches. And he that overcomes, how do we overcome? We talked about this last time. What did John say? First John chapter 5, that we overcome. The one who overcomes is the one who believes Christ, right? We overcome by simple faith in Christ. And the one who overcomes, now notice, will not be hurt by the second death. Every time you find the word death in your Bible, you can replace that word with the word separation. When you physically die, your body is being separated from your spirit. Your body is going back to the ground where it came, and your spirit is going back to the Lord who gave it. We're, we will see in a few chapters from now, we're going to see the spirits of those who had been martyred for the cause of Christ. And there they are in the presence of the Lord. Death means separation. Now the second death is where a person is entering into a Christless eternity and they are forever separated from the Lord in what the Bible calls outer darkness. Total isolation, total separation, complete darkness. Imagine the degree of insanity that will eventually come upon the soul who finds themselves in outer darkness. See, we got this idea that, well, hey, all, all of my buddies are going to be there and we're going to party and, you know, all that. No, no. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says it is outer darkness. It is total separation from anything that is of light, all right? Now, let me close with just two simple exhortations. The, first of all, we know that this, this elder, uh, Polycarp, that he was, um, as I say, he was in his early 30s. On February 23rd, 155 A.D., he was arrested and he was burned at the stake. He was 86 years of age. The arresting officer had pity upon this guy. Obviously, the Roman soldiers did not consider it, you know, to be some great honor to you know, to snuff out some 86-year-old dude, right? And so the arresting officer said, old man, just burn some incense. Say that, that Caesar is Lord, and you can go home, and you can go on with the rest of your life, however long that's going to be. You're 86 years old. I don't think you got much time left, but look, you can have the rest of your life yourself. Just do this. And of course, Polycarp said, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that. And the guy became enraged. And the guy said to Polycarp, what harm can it do to sacrifice to the emperor? It's just a pinch of incense and three words. You see, that's how compromise always approaches the believer. It's no big deal, right? It's a little bit of incense. It's three stinking words for crying out loud. Why can you not say that? And what Polycarp said in response is that for 86 years, he has done me no wrong. How can I then blaspheme my king who saved me? And they put him on that pile of wood, and they burned that guy uh, to death. Now, the fascinating thing is that this church, Smyrna, is located in the modern city today in Turkey known as Izmir. And so I was curious. I Google mapped uh, Izmir, and I put up in the search uh, churches. And I took a screenshot of it because I thought this was very exciting. There's over 18 evangelical churches in downtown Izmir today, right? This is a Muslim nation, and Christianity is thriving there. Now, there is no Christian witness in Ephesus, right? Ephesus, I mean, they, they were something, weren't they? There's nothing there today. Here is a church struggling, and yet 2,000 years later, the Christian witness is still continuing. Now look, let me, let me just close with, with two words of exhortation. First of all, for those of you who are not the followers of Christ, once again, I want you to understand that salvation is spoken of in the simplest terms in Scripture. God is not asking for your right arm. God is not asking for all of the treasure that your family has. All that is required for salvation is for you to place your trust on Christ, believing that what he did on the cross satisfies the wrath of God for all of your sin. 
Not just the sin that you committed 20 years ago, but the sin that you'll commit 20 years from now. You are simply saying to the Father, I am trusting on the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that all of the sin of humanity was imputed to him, and I am raised by his, I am, I am justified by his resurrection, and all of his righteousness is imputed to me. All of my sin goes to him, and all of his righteousness goes to me. That is all that salvation is about. It is about this exchange. Now, yes, there's discipleship, and there are rewards and all of these things, but I'm talking about how is one brought into a right relationship with their creator. And it, is, it isn't any more complicated than just breathing a simple prayer, I now trust in Christ. And if you will do that, your long war against your creator will be over with. And we have people over here in the prayer room. They want to pray with you. They want to answer your spiritual questions. Once again, I ask you, do not leave here today not being made right with the one who oh so loves you. Now, for those of us who are the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, Let's understand what is happening in our world today. This is from the American Magazine, the title of the article, Modern Martyrs. In the 20th century, there were more Christians killed because of their faith than in all of the centuries of Christian persecution combined. Do you understand that more people were destroyed for their faith in Christ in the 20th century than in the previous 19 centuries combined. Millions upon millions of our brothers and sisters in Christ lost their life for no other reason than they were the followers of Christ. From the New American, we're told this, there is a war being waged against the world's Christians, and unfortunately, American Christians have been lulled or shamed into silence while secular and progressive voices in media and our own government have sought to keep us in the dark. This war, most accurately, a war between love and hate, a war between good and evil, is raging and spreading like wildfire left to burn uncontrolled. And all of this has occurred as the citizens in the only nation in the world build upon the principles of Christian love and justice are safely sleeping in carefully constructed, a carefully constructed bubble of ignorance and distraction. We have to understand that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the bride of Christ, I hear people say, look, don't tell me that the church is going to be saved, uh, you know, uh, from, from the tribulation. And, and I hear people say, hey, the Lord is not going to beat up his bride in the tribulation before he marries her. You look around the world, the bride of Christ is getting the snot kicked out of her today. Look at what is happening in northern Nigeria right now. Look at what's happening in Eritrea. Look at what is happening in North Korea. You see, you and I, we are living in a ever-shrinking island. And what we need to be asking ourselves is this. Look, God has prospered you. God has prospered me. You're rich. I'm rich. Now, I'm not Jeff Bezos rich, right? I'm not making a rocket going into outer space. But you and I, by, by looking at all of these other churches around the world, you and I are wealthy. Now, why has the Lord prospered you? And why has the Lord for a time given you great freedom? And maybe that freedom won't be here in the near future. Who knows? But for now, he's given you freedom, and he, is giving, he has given you material wealth. Now, why has he brought all of this into your life? Could it be that one of the callings that he has placed upon the American church is that we would bring relief to our brothers and sisters around the world who are struggling in so many incredible ways. What did the writer of Hebrews say? Look, the writer of Hebrews said, now you remember those who are imprisoned as if you were imprisoned with them. Imagine this morning, you find yourself in a foreign jail for no other reason than being a believer. What would you want the rest of us to be doing for you right now? You're in this foreign prison. What, what do you want the rest of us to be doing? Well, that is what you 
need to be doing. And I believe that there is great reward for that person who is faithful to minister in very practical ways to the persecuted church. I think this is what Jesus, one of the aspects of what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 25, when he said, look, the king is going to say, look, truly, whatever you did to one of these, the least of my brethren, you have done to me. I just ask you as a congregation, look, figure out a way in which you can be a blessing to another brother or sister in Christ somewhere around the world who's going through great struggle. Just figure it out, right? Do your own research, right? Don't, don't do, look, look for an organization where a lion's share of the money is going out to those who need it the most. Don't be donating your money to these organizations that are sending out these glossy magazines and they spend all of their money on marketing and their CEO is getting a quarter of a million a, a year in ways. No, you find that simple organization that is an open channel to take your money and get it to those people around the world that need it the most. And let's make sure that we pray. As Kent Hughes said, look, in prayer, Prayer, human impotence cast itself at the feet of divine omnipotence. Let's make sure that we don't forget that there are so many people that love Christ and they are going through a hell on earth. We've got brothers and sisters. They are locked in shipping containers in Eritrea in, in that mid-eastern heat for crying out loud. Let's remember them this week in prayer. Let's make sure that we are storming the gates of heaven with our prayers until we see the church of Jesus Christ living in freedom. That is what you would want somebody to do for you if you were in prison. So let's make sure that that is what we are doing. Let's pray that we would become a congregation that God uses to minister grace and peace and love to our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you that you have blessed our lives so abundantly. Lord, we give you, we give you thanks for our freedom. We give you thanks for the prosperity that we find ourselves in right now. We thank you, Father, for the, the homes that we have. We've got air conditioning. We've got heat. We're driving, you know, cars that work well. We've got refrigerators at home that are filled with food. We've got chest freezers that will keep us going for long periods of time. Father, you have prospered the American church. And I would ask, Lord, that you would open up opportunities where we individually, as well as we as a congregation, could minister in practical ways to those that need it the most. So, Father, I, I would ask that your Holy Spirit would cause us to become restless this week, that we would be bugged by the fact that we've got brothers and sisters that are going through hell on earth right now, and that we would not be satisfied until we are helping somebody in some way. So, Lord, I trust that for those of us that's going to take you and your word seriously, I trust that you're going to lead us now in the right direction to that person, that family, that congregation that needs our help. And, Lord, Father, I confess, I confess that I just don't care the way that I should. Lord, I get so busy, and I just don't care about what's going on in some parts of the world. Lord, help, help me, help us as a congregation to care. Help us to see the world through the same lens that Jesus is seeing it through. Father, use this church to be a blessing to the Smyrna's around the world. And Lord, help us to be faithful to you until the day that we die. For we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen.